as you've maybe heard from my bio, I'm actually, my background is uh, macroeconomics, I'm a sort of monetary economics. But uh, nowadays we all are banking uh, experts too. But in fact, uh, it would be, should be Ignacio Angeloni, who's, who's one of the, the key project managers of the banking union, who should be here. But you can imagine that uh, he's uh, busy doing some other things. So, so that's why I'm here. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I will be uh, talking about uh, towards a European banking union, uh, why, uh, how, and when. So the idea is to give a little bit of, of an overview of, uh, first of all, um, uh, where do we come from and where, why uh, do we need to change things. Uh, secondly, how are we going about uh, implementing a European banking union, uh, designing a European banking supervisor, and then thirdly, uh, I want to also say a few words about uh, the calendar uh, ahead uh, and issues related to the timing of reform, which uh, is, is never uh, right but needs to be done in, in any case, before concluding. So that's the, the, the plan, and I hope I'll, I'll be able to stick to uh, basically 20 to, to, to 30 minutes. Okay. Um, so if we think about the Maastricht uh, blueprint, um, it very much was a concept of a quite narrow uh, monetary union where you had a single currency, the euro, uh, an independent central bank with a clear objective uh, of maintaining price stability close to below 2%, uh, and operating monetary policy in an efficient uh, integrated uh, financial uh, market and financial system with uh, efficiently working in the bank uh, market and efficiently working settlement and payment uh, system. Uh, there was very little in terms of unifying fiscal policy, very little in terms of unifying some of the supply side uh, policies. And at the beginning, there were conflicting views on, on banking supervision, uh, where some of uh, the uh, fathers of uh, EMU uh, argued that uh, it was important to uh, also unify uh, supervisory policies as a complement to monetary policy, uh, whereas others uh, thought this was uh, too much linked to fiscal policy, to uh, national politics, and hence should remain decentralized. And I think the reasons for these different views were both political and uh, intellectual. You can think of, of uh, arguments on, on both sides. And so the treaty uh, provisions basically uh, provided for the possibility that uh, the ECB would, in general, support uh, national supervisory authorities, would contribute to uh, financial uh, stability. Um, and, of course, importantly, Article 127.6, which uh, has now been used in order to give uh, the ECB uh, supervisory responsibilities, already stated that uh, ECB may be assigned specific prudential supervisory tasks by an unanimous council decision, and that's indeed uh, what has happened. Now, um, I don't think I need to say much in this country about uh, sort of where we're coming from and uh, how uh, the problems uh, arose, but let me just give you a very quick uh, uh, overview. I mean, there were obviously clear skies, what looked like clear skies until 2006, the changeover was technically seamless. There appeared to be a uh, movement towards more financial integrated markets. Uh, this was particularly seen in the interbank uh, money market. Uh, negligible sovereign bond spreads. and beginning of EMU, also some cross-border bank mergers and acquisitions. And this, of course, was in the context of favorable global economic conditions. Uh, credit booms in several euro area countries, including uh, this country. Uh, and sort of slowly building up competitiveness gaps, uh, current account imbalances, which um, were not an issue because they were easily financed by uh, private capital flows. But as often happens, uh, when the tide goes out, you can see the rocks, right? When the, 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 the capital flows uh, turned around, in, in part, uh, uh, as a result of, of the, the, the global uh, financial crisis, then some of the fault lines of, of EMU, of this narrow concept of, of EMU, uh, became clear. And this is just uh, one graph that uh, circulates the, the kind of the boom uh, in capital uh, flows from uh, non-distressed euro area uh, banks into the, the, the uh, uh, 
pink line here shows you the capital flows, the banking flows into distressed uh, countries, including uh, Ireland, and how it stopped uh, in uh, the second half of 2008. Now, when that happened, um, the national booms turned into busts. So one on the left-hand side here, what you see is credit growth to the non-financial private sector. Uh, split up again in distressed versus non-distressed uh, countries and then for the euro area as all. Well. And you see, of course, how there was a quite big difference in credit growth uh, between the two uh, 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 regions, so to say, uh, in the run-up to the crisis. And then, of course, uh, recently we have the, the reverse uh, happening. So the deleveraging is going on much more strongly in uh, the distressed countries relative to the non-distressed countries where credit growth is still uh, slightly positive. This led to a f uh, financial fragmentation, which you also see in the uh, short-term interest rates on uh, bank loan rates, uh, as you see, whereas, of course, in the boom periods, actually, this shows Germany, France, Spain, and Italy. The rates in Spain and Italy were on the low side relative to, to Germany. Of course, after the bust, and uh, finan after financial uh, fragmentation set in, you get the opposite. Um, one of the big causes of this uh, fragmentation uh, was what I guess is now uh, commonly known as the so-called doom loop or the, the negative loop, the adverse loop between sovereign and banking risks. This, this graph uh, basically gives you uh, an illustration of that. It shows on the x-axis, uh, the price of sovereign risk as captured by uh, credit default swaps, and on the y-axis, the price of uh, basically uh, banking risks as captured by uh, credit default swaps. And the blue dots are basically the relationship in the United States, whereas the red dots are the relationship in the euro area. And you see how in the euro area, uh, there was this very uh, adverse interaction between the two types of risks. Of course, initially, uh, particularly in countries like Ireland and Spain, it was the banking risk that translated into sovereign risks because of the implicit liabilities of uh, uh, coming from uh, resolving and restructuring uh, banks. Uh, but then, of course, there was two-way two feedback towards the banking sector because as sovereign risks increased, um, also the asset side of banks where on average there's about 10% of the assets uh, on banks in the euro areas. Well, not 10%, I think it's less, but at least in some countries it's up to 10% of the asset side is holdings of sovereign bonds. So if the sovereign risks uh, increase, then the asset side of banks is impaired, and that leads then to uh, an impairment also of, of uh, capital uh, advocacy. Um, so this um, basically... Uh, led to this, this uh, uh, negative loop between sovereign and, and, and uh, banking risks and uh, resulted, uh, again, in, in this fragmentation so, uh, of the financial market. So this is just one example where we show uh, the cross-country standard deviation of uh, insecured interbank lending <coughs> rates uh, in the euro area for all countries. That's the left-hand panel and for the non-distressed countries. And you see the cross standard, the, the standard is much higher if you include the non-distressed uh, uh, countries. So again, the, 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 the banks that are located in, in distressed countries have to pay much more for their short-term funding in the interbank market than those uh, that do not. And you see the same thing in, um, in longer-term uh, funding of banks. So this is uh, two other example. The left-hand uh, graph gives you spreads on senior unsecured uh, debt for the euro area average. That's the middle. So it gives you the the, uh, the blocks give you uh, the, the variations uh, across uh, across banks. The two on the right hand side are France and Germany. So in, in general, much lower. And on the left hand side, you have Italy and Spain. Again, uh, just for as an example, again showing that funding costs were very much larger in in the distressed countries than in the non-distressed countries. And the same is true for covered bonds, which is uh, only. And of course, this had the, then this knock-on effect on the real economy, because also <laughs> bank lending rates, as I showed in a minute, um, uh, were, uh, became fragmented. 
The ECB, of course, has, has, has uh, taken a number of, of measures to try to address some of that fr uh, fr fragmentation. Probably the most important measure is uh, the decision to uh, have a full allotment of uh, lending operations. So banks, when they have funding problems, they can come with their collateral to uh, the ECB and get funding uh, from uh, the ECB at, uh, at, a, at a fixed rate. And of course that has helped uh, a lot in, in resolving those uh, funding problems <coughs> together with uh, the fact that the maturity structure uh, was uh, lengthened um, uh, in those funding, in those uh, long-term uh, refinancing operations. But, um, so, so, so to, just to sum up in terms of, I mean, what are the risks that we, we saw, I mean, and what are the problems to be addressed? There's basically three, uh, I would say. I mean, the first one is to address this adverse loop between banks, public finances, and macro performance that was so uh, dominant and, and so visible in, uh, the, since the, the, the Great Recession uh, broke out, the financial crisis broke out, and the financial fragmentation that uh, this led to. Uh, the second is uh, to address some of the cross-border externalities and national biases in supervision, which of course interacted uh, and also led to uh, financial fragmentation. And of course there are a number of ways in which we've seen that, uh, going from under provision of national refunding of troubled cross-border banks, because of course national authorities try to shift some of the burden to uh, the foreign uh, authorities, and as a result the problems are not uh, resolved as quickly as maybe they should. Uh, but also, in con uh, reversely, uh, incentives to ring fence liquidity within national borders. Uh, so supervisors, even if their banking system is healthy, they try to keep the liquidity within uh, the system. So that, and again, that leads to, to a fragmented uh, uh, money market. Uh, and finally, also incentives to generate demand for government debt uh, through uh, national uh, banking systems. So. To address those cross-border externalities and supervision, I mean, the obvious way to, to solve that is to unify supervision so that a unified supervisor can take those externalities into account and take a cross-border or European perspective. And then finally, I mean, more generally, uh, the fact that uh, you, you still had uh, national supervision and, of course, I mean, there, there were initiatives to kind of harmonize the rule book and, and of course, the EBA was created uh, early, relatively early on in the crisis to, to, um, uh, to further, uh, to, to, to basically come up with a single rule book. Uh, in practice, we still saw quite a bit of fragmented and ineffective uh, effective banking supervision. There are, of course, a number of initiatives that have been taken to, to try to address, uh, for example, the, the loop. One of them is fiscal, I mean, get the fiscal house in order. This is not what I'm talking about here. Here, I'm talking mostly about addressing this, this financial trilemma, the fact that uh, it has sh been shown to be um, uh, incompatible to have national supervision systems, an integrated financial market, and a single monetary union. And this has led to, to basically uh, the initiative by uh, the, the governments, uh, by the, the European Council, to uh, push forward uh, the idea of a banking union. Now, as we all know, a banking union basically has three blocks. And I will be talking mostly about the first block, which is the single supervisory mechanism, which is a unified supervisory uh, framework and, and, and authority. But if you want to break the loop, this negative loop between um, uh, banking risks and sovereign risks, also, the, the second two, the two, the second and the third pillars will uh, eventually have to be dealt with. The first, the second one being single resolution mechanism. If banks is are in trouble, um, there has to be a European single uh, uh, resolution authority that uh, deals with this to again address some of these externalities that otherwise uh, arise, and to also address the issue of burden sharing. Uh, that uh, arises in, in those cases. And uh, thirdly, um, it will also be important eventually to have a harmonized uh, deposit and even a single uh, deposit uh, guarantee scheme. At this point, 
uh, the ambition is much less. It's basically to harmonize the deposit uh, guarantee schemes. These three pillars will be based on very importantly common rules, where, again, there's still a lot of work to be done in a single rule book, and a common uh, supervisory practices, which is really what, what the single supervisory mechanism, the, the ECB, uh, will, is, is working on as we, as we speak. So it is these three pillars, and let me now focus on, on the first one, which is a super, single supervisory mechanism. So, um, uh, okay, the timing, uh, basically this is where uh, we are up to now. Uh, it started in June 2012 with the Euro Area Summit that launched uh, the idea of uh, the banking union. Uh, then there was in September 2012 the Commission's uh, first draft. Uh, December 2012, agreement in the EU Council. Then the first half of this year, uh, agreement, the trilogue uh, agreement between the European Parliament, the Council, and the Commission. And then finally, uh, a couple of weeks ago, in November, uh, the adoption of the SSM regulation. And so now, basically, we can uh, start full force uh, implementing this. Looking forward, uh, there's two important uh, next steps. The first one is uh, something that is foreseen in the SSM regulation, which is a kind of a due diligence exercise. If you take on, the ECB takes on new responsibilities in terms of supervising banks, it wants to make sure that it doesn't get uh, all the, the bad uh, apples. Uh, so we have to deal with what's called, sometimes called the legacy uh, assets. And that is what the, the comprehensive assessment that um, uh, some information of which was announced uh, again uh, two weeks ago uh, very recently is, is all about. This will be taking place basically from now till November uh, next year. Uh, and uh, then in a year's time, in November 2014, uh, the plan is to uh, uh, start operationally with uh, the single uh, supervision. Obviously, uh, the timing of all this uh, is partly driven by what's going on in the crisis, partly driven by the political uh, process, by the political agenda, um, uh, but is also risky in terms of uh, um, its interaction with the kind of incipient recovery that we're now uh, uh, facing. So one of the challenges of managing this whole comprehensive assessment and then the start of uh, the SSM will to make sure to do it in a way such that uh, we do not endanger uh, the, the recovery that uh, we hope uh, will uh, continue um, uh, uh, over, the next, uh, over the next year. Okay, let me then talk a little bit about uh, the how. Um, uh, so the... Um, SSM, the Single Supervisory Mechanism, or the ECB, uh, will uh, have both micro-supervisory tools and macro-prudential uh, uh, tools. I mean, the micro-supervisory tools are basically all the ones that national uh, supervisors have. So they, uh, uh, the ECB will have to decide uh, on authorization and withdrawal of authorization of credit institutions. It will have to give its okay on merge and acquisitions of qualifying holdings. <coughs> It, of course, will implement uh, all the Basel III type of prudential requirements on capital adequacy, on large exposure limits, on liquidity, leverage, and disclosure, internal governance and controls, um, decisions on fit and proper of, of, uh, of management, and so on and so forth. It will also do uh, Pillar II type of activities in, in Basel III, so supervisory review, stress tests, uh, which may lead to additional uh, prudential uh, requirements. And of course, one of the big advantages is that it will be able to take a consolidated approach, a group level approach rather than uh, uh, solo supervision. Um, in order to do all that, it will apply, of course, the relevant union and national law. And that's where, again, the EBA, European Banking Association, will play an important role in. Uh, uh, um, implementing the single uh, rule book in, in the EU, uh, so which goes beyond the, the euro area. Uh, ECB will be able to in, uh, conduct investigations, collect statistical and qualitative information, uh, do on-site inspections, uh, sanction banks, and so on and so forth, uh, also apply early intervention tools. So th these will be the main uh, powers. Now, 
Other policy areas, some other policy areas, we will remain at national level, in particular uh, the supervision of non-banks, for example, insurance uh, companies, um, anti-fraud, and consumer uh, protection. So it, it's focused on micro-supervision of, of banks, uh, credit institutions. In addition, what, uh, there will also be some macro-prudential uh, tools uh, the, the new supervisor um, will uh, have. Um, but here, uh, the picture is a bit more nuanced in the sense that national authorities will remain the competent for national macro-prudential requirements. For example, implementing loan-to-value ratios uh, will, be, will remain uh, uh, a, a national uh, uh, instrument. But for those instruments that are currently in EU law, in the um, Capital Requirement Directive, for example, counter-cyclical buffers, capital buffers, and buffers for uh, systemically important financial institutions, uh, there will be this kind of two-level uh, operation. So national authorities will have to, uh, will, will remain responsible for uh, the use of those instruments, and they will have to notify the intended decision to the ECB, which may object, and if this happens, uh, the, these national authorities will have to consider the ECB's reasons. Again, important in order to ensure that there is uh, some coordination in the uh, application uh, of those tools. Uh, on the other hand, the ECB will be able to apply more stringent macroprudential measures, so will be able to top up some of the national uh, decisions. If the national authority objects, then the ECB has to consider its, its, its reasons. So there's this uh, 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 kind of um, and, um, sort of division of labor, maybe that's not the right word, between the ECB and the national authorities in this sense. And the reason is, is mainly because, of course, macro prudential policies, the big advantage of them is that they can be granular. They can be used to address where the financial systemic risks are building up, which as we've seen, often is locally. Uh, and so it's good that the national or the local authorities can actually implement. But on the other hand, of course, there are externalities. Uh, there is issues of level playing field. There is um, uh, externalities that may affect uh, other. So there may be, for example, this under provision of, uh, or national authorities may um, uh, sort of be reluctant to lean against booms if that means that uh, sort of their financial uh, sector is uh, uh, will will have uh, will be disadvantaged relative to say other parts of the, the euro area. So it's important to have also there uh, an important role of DCB and, and of coordination. Geographical scope: uh, the single supervisor, of course, automatically includes all euro area countries. Um, but there is a right to enter for uh, the so-called ALT, so the non-euro area EU countries. They can uh, decide to join uh, in what's called close cooperation by adopting the appropriate legislation and committing to abide to any guidelines or requests by the ECB, which will also include that, they, of course, they have to provide all the information on its credit institutions that ECB May request, and there are a number of, of sort of safeguards uh, and rules that govern this interaction between the non-euro area supervisors that uh, decide or countries that decide to join the SSM and the decision making at the SSM, which will be mostly uh, uh, euro area decision making, will be the governing council that ultimately uh, decides. In terms of institutional scope. Uh, there's an important distinction to be made between so-called significant credit institutions and the non-significant credit institutions. So the ECB will only directly supervise, of course, with the assistance of national authorities in the preparatory and implementing activities, uh, the significant credit institutions. So, and here you have a number of uh, criteria that uh, are used to determine uh, the basically 130 significant credit institutions that have been uh, listed. It's uh, based on size, so all banks greater than 30 billion, or all banks whose uh, asset to GDP ratio is greater than 20%. Um, it, uh, of all financial institutions that are under direct financial assistance from the FSF will be under ECB supervision. 
the three largest banks in each economy, so for small uh, economies that don't really have large banks, uh, the ECB will still supervise the three uh, largest banks in, in each country. And the more generally, uh, the ECB can decide uh, to take under its supervision um, uh, other uh, banks that it deems uh, to be uh, important from a systemic uh, uh, matter. So that will be the, the, the main scope, institutional scope of the direct supervision. Um, but all 6,000 banks eventually fall under the responsibility, all 6,000 uh, banks in the euro area will fall under the responsibility of the ECB. However, for those 6,000 minus 130, um, the national uh, supervisory authorities will continue to uh, uh, supervise the banks. And the ECB will basically uh, supervise the supervisors, if you like. So they will control uh, this national supervision. Um, of course, if there are issues that require attention, then the ECB can always decide to call a particular bank or a particular type of banks into its own direct supervision. Uh, so that's the way, that's kind of the stick uh, that the ECB has in order to ensure um, uh, proper supervision by uh, the national competent authorities. That's the institutional scope. Okay, I don't need to say much, I think, on the government's arrangement. So there will be a supervisory board, which uh, will consist of one representative of each national banking authority from the participating member states. It will consist of four representatives appointed by the ECB and a chair and a vice chair. And we are now in the process of recruiting the chair, uh, which I think should be announced uh, sooner rather than later, um, and of course also uh, uh, hiring the senior management of uh, the single supervisory mechanism. There will be a steering committee of about 10 members which will prepare uh, the meetings of the supervisory board. Um, and the supervisory board will basically take all supervisory uh, decisions Ultimately, it's only the governing council that can take those decisions. Uh, but um, the way it is structured also in order to, to separate the supervisory decision as much as possible from monetary policy decisions, is that normally the ECB governing council will sort of wave through uh, those, uh, those decisions. And uh, only when it objects, uh, it will be able to, to bring back the issue to the supervisory board. Okay, if a non-euro area country disagrees and the governing council confirms its objection, then uh, the country may notify the ECB that it will not be bound to it. So again, there are some safeguards for those uh, countries that are not euro area countries but decide to, uh, to, uh, to join uh, in close uh, cooperation. Okay, um, of course, just two institutional aspects. Uh, first of all, on, on the relation between supervision and monetary policy at ECB, the regulation is clear that there should be separation between the two, uh, the two functions of the, uh, the ECB. Um, and of course, uh, the separation should not be such that we cannot kind of reap some of the benefits of having supervision at the central bank. The benefit being that central banks typically are very independent institutions, therefore can sort of resist some of the political pressures that uh, often arise in these fields. Uh, and there are also natural places to handle financial stability because of their lender of last resort function, expert knowledge of banking sector, and so on and so forth. But of course, there are some risks in terms of conflicts of interest and reputational risks. So the way uh, this will be handled is by clearly separate both functions in terms of objectives, in terms of instruments, in terms of communication, it will be very different communication uh, uh, platforms and tools, and in terms of accountability. Uh, uh, related to accountability, um, uh, as you may know, the ECB has uh, entered into an interinstitutional agreement with the European Parliament uh, where um, it's uh, laid out uh, how the ECB will uh, be accountable for its new uh, tasks. There's a number of aspects mentioned here. Of course, there's financial independence. All of the activities that the ECB will do um, as a supervisor 
will be financed uh, by the, the banking system itself through supervisory uh, fees. Again, this is not something that's common across uh, countries, so it's, it's an area of harmonization, uh, but I think it's a quite important one. There will be personal independence of members of the supervisory board and the steering committee. Uh, there will be code of conduct. Uh, there will be procedures to prevent conflicts of interest, cooling off periods, uh, and so on. Uh, and then more, uh, maybe uh, equally importantly, uh, there will be control by the European uh, Parliament. So the European Parliament will, have, will be able to run investigations. Um, it uh, has a say in the selection procedure of the, ch the chair and the vice chair. Uh, uh, and again, this institutional arrangement basically lists the type of communication and reporting that uh, the ECB will have to do to the European Parliament. Uh, uh, and in addition, of course, the ECB will also uh, report to national parliaments, uh, the EU Council and, and the Commission. Okay, I think I probably can skip uh, this. This is just uh, uh, sort of a, a quick summary of all the things that have been going on actually leading up to now the, the real uh, implementation. So there basically have been six important work streams where the current supervisors have worked together with the ECB to prepare uh, all the material. One important work stream was just mapping the Euro area banking system, just defining who the significant credit institution was a non-trivial exercise because we did not really have sort of harmonized uh, data on a consolidated basis. Uh, second important work stream is legal issues relating to the framework uh, regulation. So now that legislation has been uh, uh, sort of uh, published, uh, secondary leg legislation needs to be uh, prepared. I mean, basically has been prepared and, and will be published, uh, I think, by the end of, uh, of this year. So that's really about how the rules of procedure with which the ECB will uh, implement uh, uh, the supervisory activities. There is a work stream on the supervisory model and supervisory manual. If you look across the, the system, uh, there's very different practices in terms of uh, how uh, banks are supervised. And of course, uh, as with, uh, uh, the EC with, with monetary policy, uh, there has been an attempt to sort of try to take the best uh, of all uh, traditions and come up with a, a single supervisory model, single supervisory manual. Data issues have been very important. Uh, again, uh, one of the key success factors of good supervision is to have the information in, in, uh, in a format that is uh, efficient and effective. Uh, this is uh, the fourth work stream. Okay, then there was a separate work stream to prepare a comprehensive review that I will uh, quickly uh, discuss in the next slide. And then finally, of course, there's all the log logistics of setting up basically a, a new organization, which will be the same size almost as the ECB as it is now. So basically doubling uh, st the staff. I mean, we currently have about staff of 1,400, 1,500 people at ECB. Uh, it's planned that uh, in the first step there will be 800 people uh, directly working for the new supervisor, plus 300 additional people for the, what we call the shared services, which is the IT services, the statistical services, legal services, and so on and so forth. So it's almost like uh, doubling, and, and of course setting up this organization in a short time is also a, a, a challenge and an important uh, work stream. Again, in all those areas we've been working basically over the past uh, year, uh, ever since the push for banking union was, was given, but of course with limited resources, it's only now that we can go ahead full steam and actually uh, hire, uh, put the resources to work. Okay, this is basically my sli last slide before, uh, before uh, concluding. Um, going forward, a very important and probably the most important uh, element of uh, the, the route towards banking union is the so-called uh, comprehensive assessment. So this is the kind of the due diligence of the banking sector in uh, the euro area. The objectives of this comprehensive assessment is to increase the transparency of uh, the health of the banking system, and particularly the significant uh, banks in the euro area, to make sure that uh, investors uh, know what's going on in the banks, to repair the balance sheets, if it turns out that uh, there's still some 
uh, sort of hidden uh, losses in uh, some of those uh, balance sheets. And by doing so, both to, to build confidence in the banking sector in the euro area so that banks can lower their funding costs, that they can actually access if those that cannot or that have uh, to pay big uh, funding costs or have high funding costs, that they can again uh, access the market uh, at reasonable uh, uh, conditions so, and, and thereby build, build confidence and, and um, <coughs> reduce the, the vulnerability of uh, the banking system in the euro area. There are basically three, so it's comprehensive assessment uh, uh, and it consists of three uh, pillars, if you like. The first one is a kind of top-down supervisory risk assessment. So this will be basically at ECB we've been developing a, a risk assessment system uh, which will allow us both from a, a quantitative and a qualitative uh, perspective to make some judgments on key risk factors of each individual bank in terms of its business model, in terms of uh, its liquidity situation, in terms of uh, the leverage uh, and the funding uh, profile it, it, it has. So that will be the first very important pillar. And of course that risk assessment uh, system will also be used by the SSM uh, once we start in, in November 2014. The second important pillar, and that's one uh, element that is, has been discussed uh, a lot for, for a while, is the so-called asset quality uh, review. This is basically about going into detail into the books of uh, banks and trying to see whether banks, uh, particularly for those assets that are of a more risky nature, whether they uh, perform uh, the adequate standards in terms of the valuation of this risk in terms of providing loan losses, in terms of the collateral uh, that uh, um, is, is being used for, for some of these assets and so on and so forth. So this is um, assessment of, of data quality, of asset valuations, of classification of non-performing exposures, of collateral valuation and provisions. It is comprehensive in the sense that it covers uh, both credit and market exposures and it will follow a risk-based targeted approach. So each bank or each supervisor will have to give to uh, the ECB basically uh, which assets, uh, amongst them the most risky assets, uh, that, uh, for which then there will be an in-depth analysis, including uh, loan by loan or instrument by instrument analysis. So obviously in a year's time one cannot do a kind of a full assessment of, of uh, the whole uh, the whole balance sheet. So it will be kind of a targeted risk-based uh, approach. This will allow us to give kind of a, um, a sort of a better assessment of uh, the current state. So it's a point-in-time assessment. Basically, it's the balance sheet at the end of this year that will be the, the starting point of that, that assessment. It's a point-in-time assessment. And then the third uh, pillar will be the stress test. And so this will be done in, in collaboration with the European Banking uh, Authority. Um, uh, and it's a forward-looking view on uh, banks' uh, shock absorption capacity under stress. So it will be a, a stress test that um, uh, basically tests the, the bank's ability to, uh, to uh, survive uh, or to, to, to be um, kind of resistant to uh, 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 stress scenario. We have given, the ECB has given uh, quite a bit of information on the uh, asset quality review in, uh, in a, um, uh, a press uh, release and uh, uh, a press conference uh, two weeks ago. Um, the information on the stress test at, at so far is still limited because uh, basically the parameters have not yet been decided and this is being done together with the EBA, because it will not only be the euro area banks that will be stressed, but also uh, other, all other banks in uh, the European uh, Union. The idea is that these three pillars uh, basically will lead to a comprehensive judgment of each of those 130 significant grants. I mentioned, I forgot to say that this comprehensive assessment is of the significant grant, not of the 6,000. Obviously, that would not be uh, possible. Um, 
And so the idea is that on the basis of, of these three pillars, there will be a comprehensive judgment about uh, a picture uh, about the, the health of each of those uh, banks. And uh, of course, together with that, uh, there may be some uh, measures that need to be taken in, if, if there is a shortage of capital or if there are some risks that need to be addressed, then uh, this comprehensive judgment will also be accompanied by uh, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, measures to address uh, those, those risks. The idea is that this happens all before November 2014, so that in November 2014, uh, the ECB can then start with the actual uh, supervision of those 130 banks. So basically, this uh, this concludes my uh, my initial presentation. So there's big opportunities with the implementation of banking uh, union and a single supervisory system. Uh, I think we will be able to break the bank fiscal interactions. We will be able to uh, address some of the national supervisory silos, some of the home biases that uh, we have seen. We will be able to address some of the fragmentation and improve the single market and thereby help stabilize uh, the euro. What are some of the risks? The most important risk is probably the fact that the two other pillars are not fully developed yet. Uh, there's a commitment to do so. Uh, so there's still a relatively weak crisis management uh, framework which will have to be uh, addressed. Um, national influences may initially exert an excessive influence on the system. Obviously, all this has to be implemented in a very short period of time to kind of build a European perspective. Uh, it will take time, and we will have to rely, uh, at least initially, a lot on the national competent authorities. So. Uh, uh, to make this a smooth process uh, will be a, a challenge. Uh, although, I must say that uh, so far, cooperation has been very uh, productive and, and constructive. And then, of course, the third risk is that uh, there are transitional risks. Again, everything has to be implemented in a very short time. To set up the ECB, we had four-plus years. Uh, uh, now we have one year, maybe a little bit more than one year, to uh, do uh, a similar, very complex uh, uh, operation. So there's obviously uh, transitional risks. There could be early mistakes uh, with reputational loss uh, as, as a result. Uh, but uh, I guess we at ECB are trying to do everything we can to, to make it as effective as possible. So that's basically uh, my introduction.